absolutely a delight to be a part of that music. Uh, and Tammy, so grateful to be here. Where did you go? You're hiding. Well, there you are. Okay. Tammy, so grateful to be here. Richard, uh, the male line. Like, we were okay. We were okay. I got you, you thought we were very good. I thought you were good. I thought I was It is a delight, you know? And uh, one of the things about St. Mary's that I think is, uh, uh, is, is rather special is when you look at our parish list, uh, it turns out that most of our parish lists are involved in working in the parish, involved in ministry in one way or another. That's, that's, that's a wonderful thing to say about the place. My sermon today is going to be a little different than I normally do on Christmas Eve. Normally I make it light um, and, and short. Uh, the short is a relative term. This is going to be longer than normal, shorter than usual. Okay, so just, just for those of you, longer than normal means more than 10 minutes, shorter than usual means less than half an hour. Okay, so that's, Mary was just wondering what that meant. Um, because I'll, I'll tell you, and I'm starting it off like, but I, I, I wouldn't get getting someone serious tonight. Um, for me, this is an anniversary, and I don't expect um, many of you, if any of you, uh, to immediately know what I'm talking about. Um, but this is my 25th Christmas at St. Mary's. Um, I begin my second. <laughs> Um, and, and, and that's special. Right now, uh, I don't know whether it means that I'm an underachiever or what, but I'm the longest standing minister, well, not standing because I'm sitting, the uh, longest serving minister in one parish in the diocese. Uh, my neighbor to the east, Bruce Glenn Cross, and St. John the Baptist, Point Claire, is the second longest. Um, there have been opportunities over the year to consider uh, other, other churches, other ministries. Uh, St. Mary's has always uh, been a good place to be in many, many ways. It is a church that is founded on ministry. Um, and and, and, and we, we've got a lot of really wonderful stuff going on. That having been said, um, not everything's been perfect. And so as I look back over 25 years of, of ministry in St. Mary's, I just want to talk about it just a little bit. Uh, there's some things that I want to refer to. When you came in this evening, uh, you probably saw some jib rock by a wall and some wood and a couple of dollies um, and maybe some plaster work being done. This is the church constantly under repair, refurbishment, and renovation. Uh, the window back there, which we're calling Claire Parsons' window, uh, because she sits next to there with the freeze. Uh, that's brand new. We're hoping to get the other two done uh, within the next year or so. So if any of you have a spare 20000 lying around, uh, I would love, I'll pray for you. I'll bless you. I'll do it. We need, we need, that's what that's going to cost. Um, the, the roofs are constantly being repaired. Uh, we're re refurbishing and redoing our space. We put in new lighting. We need to worry about plumbing. We need to worry about furnaces. Uh, and it is a church that is constantly under refurbishment. One of the things that I've hoped for over the years, I have prayed for over the years, is that what we do physically to this place, the physical refurbishment that we work, that we work on, is a, a, a symbol or a sign or a metaphor or an image of the spiritual refurbishment that we're constantly undergoing in this place. Um, churches struggle with many things, uh, some of which are extremely silly. Uh, some churches fight over which book you're going to use for your prayers. And if that doesn't strike you as an irony, a prayer book, and we're fighting over which one? Well, both. Uh, some churches fight over which hymn book they're going to use on a Sunday morning. Um, St. Mary's, at least in my 25 years, has, has, has been spared those arguments and those fights. Uh, there are some people indeed that have chosen to leave this place because it wasn't their cup of tea. And that's not bad, because one of the good things about the Anglican Church is there's enough variety for people to find the type of liturgy and the type, the type of church that suits them. But over the years, it's been wonderful to see how St. Mary's has sharpened its focus and sharpened its understanding of ministry. But I have learned this over the years. I have learned this over the years. I deliberately said that twice. That any sense that I have of being in control of what goes on here and how it goes on is purely an illusion on my part. I am not in control. I am not in control of who comes to this parish. I am not in control of who leaves this parish. I'm not in control of who visits. I'm not in control of the events that happen in this parish. We have had some absolutely wonderful, glorious times in this place. We have also had some real tragedies and some real traumas as well. 
I am not in control of this. I am not in control of what God does in this place. Indeed, I'm not in control of what God does in my own life. Uh, when I first came to St. Mary's, one of the things that uh, we were faced with was cast iron, I'm sorry, this is boring, uh, cast iron pipes that were our heating pipes in the ground. They were supposed to be in insulated conduits and last for half a century. They were laid right on the earth, and so they rusted in short order and they kept leaking. If any of you are, well, some of you are old enough to remember the jet, the uh, Beverly Hillbillies and remember jet clamps shooting into the ground and up through the ground come a bubble and groove, you come into St. Mary's and up through the floor come a bubble in water because the pipes were shot. And so one of my first memories of this place is being here with a guy from my previous parish who was a plumber from Post and Dad and Nick, uh, and we were cutting copper. And the pipes that we see now, in those days, I could cut copper. And I was the one who cracked the concrete where it needed to be cracked operating a jackhammer. And I could throw a 125-pound jackhammer over my shoulder and walk in place. Now I can't walk. You know, I am not in control of my life. I'm not in control of the events of my life. I can influence. We can all influence our environment. And how we react to our environment, that's another subject. But we are not in control. And any image of control, any thought of control that we have is purely an illusion. We do not know what's going to happen to us when we leave this place tonight. We want the best, we hope for the best, we pray for the best, we have all the best wishes for everyone that we know and love and for this planet, that we are not in control. The events are beyond our control. And the people who put together the readings for the Sundays before Christmas, which we call the Advent season, before Sundays before Christmas, they knew this, and they were very wise. Sometimes people say to me, why do we have the readings that we do before Christmas? They seem so dark. The first Sunday of Advent talks about how messed up the planet is. It talks about wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pestilence and famine and all sorts of horrible things from way back then that are still happening now. And it's to give us a sense that we're not in control of this planet. We can't control it. Uh, and any sense that we can is an illusion. But the people who put together the readings wanted us to be aware and, 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 and present to the realities of the world around us. They did not want us to bury our heads in the sand. They did not want us to hide and pretend somehow that everything was okay. That was the first Sunday. We got better from there. Advent 2 and Advent 3 talk about the brokenness of human society, the brokenness of the human heart. These readings talk about how communities are broken. Communities are broken by rivalry and hatred, and violence, and prejudice, and racism, and all the other isms that you want to talk about. We sometimes hate each other for no reason at all, but that's part of the human condition. And the readings speak to that. And the reading says the reason why this is the case is because each one of us is broken heart. That there's something about each and every one of us that is broken. It results in broken relationships. It results in hurting one another. It results in damage and destruction. Some things are beyond our control, but it is true to say, and anyone who cannot acknowledge this about themselves, I don't know that each one of us has a dark side, each one of us has a broken side. People are saying, why are these readings leading up to Christmas? Christmas is about light and joy and life and love and all of those things, and so it is. But these readings want us to approach the Christmas season understanding what is the reality of the human condition and human experience. And I don't think you have to be on this planet for too many years to realize that you can say, yeah, you know, they got a point. The world is broken. Society is broken. Unreal. But then, on Batman 4, it all changes around. That's the last Sunday of preparation before we approach the Christmas season. At that core, it changes around. There's a strange story. When you get right down to it, it is a bizarre story. And I don't know how you understand all of this. It says that an angel appeared. I don't know how you understand angels. Uh, some places, angels are, in fancy terms, described as theophonic beings. Uh, I think that's so that we can get over the thing about angels with feathers and wings and all the rest of that. I don't know. But somehow somebody who was speaking for God, a, a, a creation who was speaking for God, appeared to a girl who was no more than 14, probably less. And she said, uh, he said, the angel said, guess what? Well, that's my translation of the Bible. You can't really find that in there, but that's really what he says. It sort of said, hail, 
You know, that's guess what in, in fancy churchy talk. So guess what? You are highly favored of the Lord. So far, so good. And you're pregnant. And not married. So, excuse me, highly favored of the Lord and unmarried pregnant don't seem to go together. And then the angel says, don't be afraid. Because the thing that is happening to you is a holy thing. Now, 14-year-old girl in a society where extramarital relations uh, was punished by stoning to death. Um, I don't think this was the first thing that was in her heart. And then, of course, Joseph becomes aware uh, of, of this. And he has the right, uh, as the one to whom Mary is betrothed, uh, to, 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 to have her stoned to death. He, he can be the one there uh, giving the instructions to have her killed for this horrible thing that she has done. Uh, and, and, and instead, he decides to be a nice guy. And so what he does is, he decides to divorce her because in that culture, control over engagement was tantamount to marriage, so he had to divorce the person you were engaged to. So he decides, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to have her killed. <laughs> Great. Uh, instead, I'm just going to divorce her and put her away quietly. Uh, so he's going to be gun. But in both cases, and then Joseph, a little later in the story, uh, he takes on to himself something that is, that is so radical. Yeah. He had every right to maintain his life. He put it all on the line. He took the risk because of what was happening. And so, we see in a very bizarre way, in a very different culture, an extremely conservative culture, uh, standing on the head of what were considered to be the norms of the time. And in that was found a goal. In that was found hope. What caused it? Obedience to God. Mary was willing to be obedient regardless of social pressure and social stigma. Joseph as well. He didn't cast her away. He didn't put her away. He didn't do what society legally told him he had a right to do. But instead, he hoped in what was to come. And in the fullness of time, that's another way of saying things. When the time is right, you see the image of the little baby being born tonight for us. Hope comes to life. And what I would like to do is, is to try and translate that into our life and experience, into your life and experience. And I think the only way I can do that is, is by being personal for, for a couple of minutes. Uh, ten years after I was uh, appointed director of this parish, uh, I was diagnosed with MS. At first, uh, it wasn't much. Um, one neurologist thought I'd turn into the disc playing golf. Um, and then he moved to Toronto and I got another neurologist. Uh, and she did some tests and she said, uh, well, I've had another patient like you, so it's either tumors on your spinal cord or MS. Um, MS became a relief diagnosis. There was a little bit of numbness. I couldn't play guitar anymore because my right hand wasn't working right. My left foot was a little numb. I had pain in my back, and I was dragging my right leg a bit. But most people who knew me would have known that anything serious was wrong. Three and two, you're engaged with the problem. And then I'll tell you, uh, wow, the future all of a sudden was kind of scary. And over the years, there was progression. The walking got a little worse. The numbness got a little worse. Uh, there are some things that I've been spared. Uh, one of the most common things for MS patients is blindness and other problems like that. I've been spared that so far. But I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. This year, I'm less mobile than I was last year. For those of you who haven't seen me in the beginning year. This year, I got my scooter on Christmas Eve. Last year, I only had a walk. I don't know. I'm not in control of my future, but if I don't tell you, I live in home. As it relates to MS, there's a lot of research going on. I can't prove this. I don't know this for a certainty. I don't know this for a fact. But I live in hope that one of these days, some researcher somewhere, maybe because it just falls all the time for, maybe because they discover a cure for another disease, will all of a sudden say, we've got it. And then I'll go to my neurologist, 
and be prescribed a treatment of either injections or surgery or some other medication because they will put out a cure. I live in hope that there will someday be a cure for me and not for me. Then the generation will come out to me. Someday they will find a cure for this disease. There's a disease that we all have. Every single one of us, and it is the brokenness of our heart. And it causes us to hurt people, it causes people to do, it causes us to do things that we ought not do, and it causes us to refrain from doing the righteous things that we should do because we like courage or, 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 or whatever. We live in a hope that based on the evidence that we see, the little baby born has brought new light and new life to the world, that someday each one of us will be the type of people that we ascribe to be. We will all be people of courage. We will all stand for righteousness. We will all oppose evil and injustice wherever we see it. It won't only be what we see. It won't only be Nelson Mandela who we celebrate. We'll all be Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and Martin Luther King Jr. and all the other heroes. We will all be heroes. And as we look at the hope that is in the reading tonight, for unto you, unto you, each one of you is born today in the city of David, a Savior. And this is going to be a sign. You're going to find it. You're going to see it. You're going to see it with your own eyes. And what you see with your own eyes will change your perspective on reality and it will transform your life. I hope tonight, tomorrow, sometime, you have already, you open your eyes to the spiritual reality of the hope that comes to the world in the birth of Jesus when we celebrate this special. Let's pray. God, we see tonight in your creation so much good, so much that is beautiful and special and loving and kind and just glorious. But we also see pain and suffering. We see children dying of easily cured diseases and malnutrition. We see a tiny percentage of the world using an incredible amount of its consumables. We see the destruction of the planet. But we also see attempts to conserve the resources that you have trusted to our care. We see attempts to reach out to the poor, and the hungry, and the lonely, and the sick, and the marginalized, the impoverished, the spirit, mind, and body. We pray for those who work for the common good. Everyone, regardless of what religion, country, whatever. And we pray for your peace on earth. We pray for ourselves too living in the richest hemisphere on the planet, consuming incredible $450 billion spent on Christmas in America alone this year. And we think that less than 10% of that would give everybody on the planet fresh drinking water and sanitation. Lord, we pray for balance. Balance in your planet and balance in our own lives. As we pray for these things, Open our hearts wherever we are in our lives, whatever our present experience is, whether it is of joy or sorrow, health or sickness, wealth or want. Open us to the hope and the joy and the love that we celebrate here this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.